Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Mormon Movie Reviews, where LDS movie lovers belong. Today, we're going to walk you through The First Vision, 1976, and this is Episode 4. In Palmyra, New York in 1820, 14-year-old Joseph Smith Jr. wonders what church to join. He feels that none of the local congregations are right, and the religions are not for him, so he wants a divine answer. One spring morning, he goes out to pray in a grove near his home and starts to pray. He feels an evil spirit trying to prevent him from supplication, and he is freed from this malevolent presence by the most glorious light accompanied by two personages, Heavenly Father and his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus tells Joseph not to join any of the churches because they are all wrong. There's a good summary for you. I also have an amusing summary, which I found on uh, movie.com. It says the uh, summary on movie.com is Joseph Smith Jr. is a youngster on the American frontier trying to figure out which Christian denomination to join. He decides to ask God himself and gets a distressing answer. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty funny uh, link there. Here is the actual uh, film itself here, the first vision film, which we're going to get to here just in a moment. Um, this is uh, probably one of the most important films that the church has ever produced. A couple of links for you is, first of all, the church has done a Gospel Topics essay on this particular, uh, on the first vision. And the Gospel Topics essays were released in 2013, 2014, and they're generally done on the most uh, controversial topics that have ha caused the most uh, distress for members, I would say. So I think that there's about 14 or 15 Gospel Topics essays. I'm not sure the exact number, but they have done a first vision account on uh, Joseph Smith's first vision. I'll put that in the show notes. There's also a uh, the Saints Volume 1, Chapter 2. The Saints Volume is a volume of church history that they are trying to redo the uh, B.H. Roberts official church history, which I want to say was compiled in like the 1925 or something like that, the official church history, the comprehensive volume of the church. And the Saints Volume has tried to do a more accurate, they're trying to be more accurate with the church history. And this particular account tries to reconcile the different versions of uh, Joseph Smith's uh, first vision that we have. I'll refer you to that. Also, Radio Free Mormon has done uh they he tackled the uh first vision in june of uh june 26 2021 i guess it was a little more than a year ago that's also pretty good resources so when it comes to talking about the first vision i would uh show you there we have a website as well we're on mormon movie reviews and we've uh, done three movies so far and this is our fourth uh movie now this first vision uh, the runtime on the first vision is 16 minutes long and this film uh, really meant a lot to me as a child. I remember watching it and, and feeling very moved and inspired. I've watched it multiple times since um, growing up and many times since. And even though the film's only 15 minutes long, it, it really it, it is still a really important church film, informing a generation of members about this important theophany. And as Richard Bushman might say, establishing the dominant narrative. Before we kick off the film, how important is the first vision to the church? Well, let's uh, listen to one famous passage uh, about its importance by uh, Gordon B. Hinckley. We declare without equivocation that God the Father and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, appeared in person to the boy Joseph Smith. Our whole strength rests on the validity of that vision. It either occurred or it did not occur. If it did not, then this work is a fraud. If it did, then it is the most important and wonderful work under the heavens that they came, both of them, that Joseph saw them in their resplendent glory, that they spoke to him, and that he heard and recorded their words. Of these remarkable things we testify. I knew a so-called intellectual who said the church was trapped by its history. My response was that without that history, we have nothing. The truth of that unique, singular, and remarkable event is the pivotal substance of our faith. Uh, President Hinckley there, he thinks it's uh, extremely vital. In other words, he, he's trying to separate the idea that, and he even points out to one of his uh, you know, doubt, doubters there, that, that there's the idea that you could not believe in the first vision and still participate in the church. It seems like he's really drawing a line in the sand there. Either it occurred and the church is true, or it did not occur and the church is false. And that's a narrative that has um, become more dominant over time. It has become more strengthened over time. Um, I do want to talk about uh, what the uh, producer of the show said about uh, about this. And there's a great article here. Uh, Casey Griffiths' introduction to the Joseph Smith's first vision came when he was a young boy. 
Since that day, whenever Griffiths reads the prophet's account of the first vision, the image that is usually in his head is that of the actor Stuart Peterson. So uh, Griffiths speaks of it as a, like an old friend. So it is, it is probably safe to say that the film is the medium through which most people experience the store of the first vision for the first time, Griffiths said. To me, that film is one of the most important methods of spreading the truth taught in the vital story of the restoration. So I, I would agree. This is basically this film is very, very dominant in how an entire generation of people viewed the first vision. And this is a pretty important article. Now, it has been almost 50 years since this film was first released. So how does the modern day uh, church uh, approach um, the first vision? Well, I would say that this, this from the church website, Joseph Smith's fir, uh, first vision stands today as the greatest event in world history since the birth, ministry, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. After centuries of darkness, the Lord opened the heavens to reveal, reveal his word and restore his church through um, his chosen prophets. So yes, it's still, and it's still very, very important to the church. Now, this film was part of a larger collection of shorts and vignettes that was compiled into a VHS tape, which included the first vision, the Restoration of the Priesthood, The Windows of Heaven, which we've already reviewed on Mormon Movie Reviews, The Last Day at Carthage, and a couple of other uh, films. So it was part of a, of a compilation. That opens with the, uh, the Spirit of God. And of course, it's got the uh, idols on here. So it's showing that the church is giving an explicit endorsement. Under the direction of the First Presidency and Council of the Twelve, that's giving it a high level of uh, review. One would expect that if it's b being released under that auspice, that it would be um, as accurate, or in other words, it would show, represent the church's position as faithfully as possible. Yeah, we're hearing the Spirit of God uh, hymn by the you music buffs out there. They're sequencing the opening line of that with the sequence of it, the spirit of God, the spirit of God, the spirit of God. It's, 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 it's sequenced. I didn't sing it very well there, but yeah, it's, they're sequencing it here. Uh, so we got Stuart Peterson here, who we're seeing here afar off, and he's running in the field here. Here's a picture of Stuart Peterson all the way back when he was portraying Joseph Smith. And then he's portrayed a lot of other films to this day. Uh, he was an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, he's really quite famous for his role in this particular film. He's portraying, of course, a Joseph Smith Jr., prophet of the restoration. And this is probably the most important uh, picture or daguerreotype that we have of Joseph Smith, which has only been released in the last little bit and is almost, uh, I would say, more likely than not, is an authentic picture of him. Producer and director is David K. Jacobs. And David K. Jacobs uh, graduated from Weber College with an Associates of Science. He completed a Bachelor of Science at Brigham Young University. He was part of the Brigham Young uh, University Motion Picture Studio and involved with uh, quite a few different uh, productions there. And he ended up uh, completing his uh, PhD in the history of motion pictures produced by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's a dissertation that I probably need to read. Throughout the ages, God has communed with man. Okay, and we're hearing a narrator here. Then the narrator is Francis Uri. And you might recognize Francis Uri from our uh, Mormon Movie Reviews Volume 1, which is where we reviewed the Windows of Heaven. He was noted for his acting career, both on the silver screen and on the stage, and probably best known for his work in as portraying uh, Lorenzo Snow. The men who were chosen to receive his direct words were called prophets. Stuart Peterson, he, uh, you know, he had a brief career as a star of G-rated films in the late 70s. Uh, he was born in 1960 in Cokeville, Wyoming, and he was 16 years old when he made the film. He's probably best known for uh, Where the Redfern Grows and Seven Alone. I looked up a quote from Peterson and he said, I wasn't really anxious to do the first vision film, but my counsel, my family counseled me that maybe it would be something that would help the church and quote. Centuries of darkness and apostasy from Christ's teachings, God once again chose to reveal himself to mankind. Okay, this is opening on a scene in Palmyra, New York, circa, according to the film and according to uh, the official church source, 1820. And Joseph is here with his family, nine brothers and sisters, total of 10 people, plus his parents. The revelation came in answer to a humble prayer by the 14-year-old boy, Joseph Smith, 
in the year 1820 near Palmyra, New York. The narration um, says that men who received his words were called prophets. That's tr that's true, sure. But women who received his words were called prophetesses, like old Hulda in the Old Testament, or uh, the four named uh, female New Testament apostles. Of course, the modern day church only calls men to revelatory positions and positions of presiding authority. So it makes sense. A male centered narrative is emphasized of saying that men who receive his words are called prophets and they leave off the female side. Now, uh, Joseph Smith, of course, he prepared for uh, four first. There's four exactly four first hand accounts of the first vision first recorded in 1832 in the prophet's own handwriting. And then in 1835 and then in 1838, which has now been canonized into the Pearl of Great Price. And then also in 1842. And the film almost exclusively relies on the official uh, 1838 account as one might would imagine. There's also several other secondary accounts of the first vision, perhaps uh, as many as five solid secondary sources. And by the way, the community of Christ calls this experience the uh, Grove experience and not the first vision. They're saying that this is the year 1820. That's a somewhat controversial date, as uh, some say that the largest revivals in the Palmyra area, uh, area were actually in 1824. This is the story of the visitation of God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. Okay, by my count, where it seems to be missing somebody here, because this is prior to Alvin passing away. So uh, there's supposed to be one more child in here, and I can't figure out who it is that's missing. Maybe you viewers out there can let me know. So we've got uh, Alvin, we've got Hiram, we've got William, we've got Joseph, we've got Lucy, we've got uh, Catherine, we have so, uh, Sophronia. Um, but we're, we're missing one person. So there's there's only there's 10 people at the table and Alvin is still alive. The film also says that the narrator says, Francis Uri says that Joseph Smith is 14 years old in the 18, um, 14 years old in the movie. But in the 1832 account, which is the only one that is penned by Joseph Smith himself, it probably reads that he was in his 16th year, making him 15 years old, whereas the other accounts say that it was 14, although there is some... Um, there's some debate as to whether it says he's in his 15th or 16th year, but if you look at the Joseph Smith papers, I think it's a six, and it looks like he's in his 16th year. That would be 15 years old. But generally, he's uh, I guess he's saying that he's uh, somewhere between 15 and 16 years old. Yes, uh, 14 and 15, that is. To the boy prophet Joseph, as told in his own words. Okay, so the narrator is going to be bowing out soon. Now, this little fanfare here seems to be used as kind of a summoning device. They're, they're, they're calling forth the people to come to uh, a, what appears to be a religious revival. But there's a great deal of evidence that suggests that the revival that is depicted in the first uh, couple of minutes of this film actually took place in 1824, not 1820. There may have been some small revivals in 1820, but the best documentation for large-scale revivals like that, like like what's portrayed in this movie is in 1824 or maybe as early as 1817, but that would make Joseph Smith quite young. I'm so glad you came this in my 15th year, there was in the place where we lived an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. Now, remember, we're tracking the 1838 account, which would be 18 years after this would have occurred, according to the account. Uh, and this narrative is going to follow the 1838 account almost exclusively. That became general among all the sects in that region of the country. We'll have the good pleasure of hearing from one of the finest preachers in the state of New York. Now, notice, and this is what we're going to see in all of the shots here. Joseph Smith seems to be kind of outside. The, the congregation, he doesn't fit in. He's always on the periphery. He's never in there. He's never really enthused about what he's hearing or what he's doing. He's just, he's kind of, they portray Joseph Smith as an outsider. There's something unusual about him. There's something special about him. He's not, he's not part of the orthodoxy. He's not one of the blind sheep. And as a child, I really remember emphasizing with uh, Joseph Smith in this particular, uh, in, in this film quite a bit. Reverend Bailey. Without any, uh, fancy Indeed, the whole district seemed affected by it, and great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties, which created no small stir and division amongst the people. 
some crying low here and others low there. Or we were damned. That's all there is to it. Saved or damned. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The preacher here again uh, is quoting from Hebrews chapter 11. And once again, we see Joseph Smith, he's not like everyone else. Everyone else is already in the church. Joseph Smith, he is not. It makes him seem like he's running from church to church. He's running. He's working as hard as he can. He's trying to find answers, and he's just working so hard. For he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11. By grace, not by works. But I don't believe one word he said. But it was straight from the Bible. He interpreted the Bible. The Bible is not a private interpretation. So you can see he gives, does a slight shake of the head there. He seems very annoyed by the bickering, and he's leaving mid-sentence. If you back it up there, maybe you can see that one more time. And he, he's not even going to, the filmmakers are not even going to let these two bickering people finish. Not a private interpretation. He's not impressed. So you're interested in religion. Which church do you have a mind to join? I'm not sure. I'm not sure which is the true church. Okay, so I'm not sure which is the true church. If we look at the 1832 account, um, it actually ends up saying that Joseph Smith had already made up his mind that all churches were wrong. In fact, that Joseph Smith went into the grove not seeking to know which church was true, but um, seeking a forgiveness of sins. Now, the film seems to suggest an idea that there is a one true church, but that is not a common sentiment of the day. Um, and for, I mean, Joseph Smith's fa own father was a universalist. So it seems to be painting the 1838 account. It, it's emphasizing the 1838 account far more than the 1832 account. Young man, all churches are true, so long as they teach Christ. But they disagree and contradict each other. Will you pray with all your power? Now you'll see here in the scene that Joseph Smith, here's all the parishioners. He's not really, he's not really, um, not joining in. He's not really into it. He's not, he's not drinking the Kool-Aid. He's not really singing here. He's not buying into what they're trying to sell. He's different. He's special. He's not convinced. Right now is the time for you to declare your faith by baptism. As to whose side you are really on. Notice he's on, again, he's outside of everyone else. The Lord's? Or the devil's? Devil's! I need the Lord. Brother, I want to give my soul to God. Oh, yeah. I believe. I believe. This is the single greatest line in Mormon cinematic history. I've got to listen to it once again. I need to get this on the ringtone on my phone. Just hear this one more time. This is Lethe Tache, who does a lot of cameos and was in 14 church films. Maybe you recognize her from The Mailbox and a few other uh, important church films. But, uh, you know, this line should be inscribed on her tombstone in Midway, Utah. And I, uh, I just love this line. I want to hear it one more time. I need the Lord. Brother, I want to give my soul to God. Oh, yeah. I believe. I believe. Now, that's a line, okay? During this and just just a quick note before we move on, the professors of religion in this film, specifically the preachers and and uh, the pastors and the bishops, they're made out to look like fanatical kooks, God or the devil. You know, they're just they're just really kooky. You know, they're just they're extremists. They're not relatable. They're they're just it's it's like bad choices that Joseph Smith all he all he sees from the uh, professors of religion is bad choices, and the uh, the followers, the congregations. They're just dumb sheep. They're just following along with cattle calls. You know, they're just singing the they're just singing the songs, and uh, they're just, you know, he's facing really really bad choices here. Now we're going to join back up with the official narrative now. Time of great excitement. My mind was called up to serious reflection and great uneasiness, considering that all could not be right, and that. And they skipped over though my feelings might be a uh, point up. Uh, poignant as well so they're they're kind of carving it up they're leaving ellipses in here to try for the sake of the film to try to keep it short but they're not reading it word for word but what you hear is a direct quote they're just they're chopping it up god could not be the author of so much confusion i determined to investigate the subject more fully one lord one faith and one baptism 
So evidently he's reading from the New Testament in the uh, Epistle to Ephesians, chapter 4. One baptism. Not three different ways. It says right here. One faith. But why do all the churches differ so much? I love how it shows Joseph Smith upstairs in the Palmyra farmhouse with all of his siblings. Um, that's really accurate. And by the light coming from in this scene again. Bible. Why do they interpret the same scripture to mean so many different things? And if there's one Lord and one faith and one baptism, why are there so many churches? Look how close these guys were to the track of this tree. I mean, they were only a couple of feet away. If you know anything about how trees fall, you everybody clears out. So, I mean, it's amazing to me how close that they were. How much solitude? We, we saw Joseph Smith inside the house reading on his own. How much solitude do you think you would have in a small house living with 11 people with absolutely nobody around? And a couple of other questions. Why does the narrator... There's Joseph Smith narrating, but then there's the other narrator. Why is the other narrator so old? He sounds like he's 70 years old. Uh, why? We, it seems like we should be hearing more from Joseph Smith uh, as the narrator. And by the way, they skipped in that last scene the part where he said he felt somewhat partial to the Methodist sect and felt some desire to be united with them. So just a couple of small notes. Uh, so great were the confusion and strife among the different denominations that it was impossible for a person young as I was and so unacquainted with men and things to come to any certain conclusion who was right and who was wrong. Now, I don't know if the filmmakers did this deliberately, but the ax right there makes its appearance in this particular scene. It was noted later on in a secondary source that Joseph Smith left an ax in the woods and then went back to it to say the prayer. So the ax kind of marked the location of where he wanted to be. And you'll see that in Saints, Volume 1, Chapter 2, uh, when you look at it, the opening, the, the picture that goes along with that is an axe that's left in the woods. I think what, when he says that's ref, he's reflecting on it again and again, I think that's just really, uh, really a good job with what they are doing here in the scene. But though my feelings were deep and often poignant, still I kept myself aloof from all these parties. Though I attended their several meetings as often as occasion would permit. All these guys are just fanatics, right? While I was laboring under the extreme difficulty, or just sheep, you know, just they're just drinking the Kool-Aid. There's really bad choices for Joseph to pick from between these two options. Difficulties caused by the contests of these parties of religionists. I believe. I was one day reading the Epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that gives to all men liberally. And it braideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. So they left off in this part some of the quote from the 1838 account, which said, For how to act I did not know, and unless I could get more knowledge than I then had, I would never know. For the teachers of religion understood the same passages of scriptures so differently as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. And I taught these same words time and time again to, um, to investigators on my full-time uh, mission to Washington, D.C. in the 1990s. I just want to back it up a tiny bit because you can hear a little trumpet in the background. And I think the trumpet um, is kind of like a light bulb that's going off in Joseph Smith's mind. It's a clever little uh, motif that they put into the score. So listen for this trumpet. Ask him faith, nothing wavering. Never did any passage of Scripture come more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again, knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. 
So Stuart Peterson, he's got to do a lot of acting in this movie without much dialogue. Mostly it's just him contemplating things. So it's kind of hard to have a movie when your main actor has very few lines. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavers. Now, we're planting seeds here. It's kind of like we're planting seeds of faith. It's a metaphor. That's the answer. And the seeds are going up towards God, God kind of like faith. the seeds will be thrown up into the air, kind of like Joseph's faith is going up towards God. And I will. I will. Okay, now we hear the hymn, Oh, How Lovely is the Morning. Now, there's a, supposedly a blooper in this section. Which I'll have you keep your eye out for I don't really know if it is a blooper, but it's on IMBD. And it says that when Joseph walks towards the grove in this scene, some scenes show untouched grass ahead of him, while others clearly show a path in the tall grass, which is the result of an earlier take. But that's not necessarily true because uh, according to, I believe it is the Pittsburgh interview in 18, I believe it is 1842, Joseph had already visited the site before and left his axe behind. So if there were paths there, that's not a blooper because he had been there before. Um, this uh, particular scene, it was shot on location in the spring of 1975 in uh, near Palmyra, New York. My determination to ask of God. I retired to the woods to make the attempt. It was on the morning of a beautiful, clear day, early in the spring of 1820. Now, um, it had really uh, rained the night before, so that mist was uh, really coming up um, when they shot the scene in 1975. Uh, in fact, the uh, director said, the sun came up, we beheld the loveliest mists we'd ever seen. It was incredible. The tall white grass sparkled and the birds burst into song, and we knew that we had been blessed with beauty that we could have never produced ourselves. And this uh, particular hymn references Joseph Smith uh, specifically oh how lovely was the morning speaking of the first vision time by the way a couple of notes since uh, we got a minute or two here this movie uh fails the bechdel test by the way in other words there's no women that speak to each other now the date of the first vision we don't really even know when the date was he just said early in the spring of 1820 uh, Bruce R. McConkie believed that the first vision was on uh, August 6, 1820. The basic idea is here, we, we don't know when the first vision took place. We don't know the day. And in fact, even the uh, year is highly questionable. Now, the soundtrack does a good job of building anticipation through this scene um, without question. Maybe he's returning to the acts. Um, now, this uh, special place of prayer that Joseph Smith is going to eventually became the uh, Sacred Grove. And we're going to pick back up with the official narrative here. By the way, you can hear the music is starting to peter out. Less and less instruments. The instruments are kind of dropping out, like Handel's uh, Farewell Symphony, if you're familiar with that. So now the music has now completely, uh, there's no more music. Uh, one instrument at a time were being reduced from the musical score, and now there's no music at all, which is showing Joseph Smith in complete solitude. And also the filmmakers during this part turned up the forest sounds, and they've amplified those kind of showing that Joseph Smith is communing with nature. No more music. There's, there's solitude here. Just him and the bugs and the trees and the birds. After I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, having looked around me, and finding myself alone, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. But something bad is about to happen. Our Father, which art in heaven, Please. 
So we're, we're hearing some very jarring sounds now. It's kind of like music, some jarring musical sounds. And also the animals in the forest are very disturbed. They're making, the filmmakers are making it seem like whatever's happening here is actually not just affecting Joseph Smith. So this isn't just a vision that's happening in his mind, you know, just a, a mental thing. It's not only affecting him, it's affecting everything around him. It's a, a real corporeal event. Even the animals are disturbed. I had scarcely done so when immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me. Now, this is a very interesting camera angle that it's going from below and up into him. It's a, I'm not sure what they're trying to show from that, but that is the only time that we see this kind of a camera angle. And had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. It's kind of like Joseph Smith is trying to cling on to consciousness here. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. But Joseph hearing these disembodied footsteps in the grove and then leaping to his feet, that's taken from the 1835 account as recorded by Warren Cowdery. In fact, I've got the quote right here. It says, quote, I made a fruitless attempt to pray. My tongue seemed to be swollen in my mouth so that I could not utter. I heard a noise behind me like someone walking towards me. I strove again to pray, but could not. The noise of walking seemed to draw nearer. I sprang upon my feet and looked round, but saw no person or thing that was calculated to produce the noise of walking. So I kneeled again, and my mouth was opened and my tongue loosed. So it's a pretty, um, pretty good rendition of that. And by the way, there's no malevolent presence in... Uh, Joseph doesn't record any malevolent presence in his uh, first 1832 account. I think the blurred image here is a nice At cinematic touch. Moment, I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction. I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. Now they cut out, uh, we're following the 1838 account again, but he also said above the brightness of the sun. And for some reason they cut that out, which I don't know why they did. Now, he says he saw two personages, or did he, that's according to 1838, or did he just see one personage who is the Lord in the 1832 account? Or did he see two personages at the same time? That's the 1838 uh, account. Or did he see one after the other, like the 1835 account? It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. Now, there's uh, no angels that are in the movie. There's no angels in the grove. And that is a contrast from the 1835 account in which he said that there were. Now, the two beings here, do they look identical to you? Not sure. Um, the identical nature of the two beings is from the uh, 1842 Wentworth account. This is the first time in the movie that we hear the qu a choir is along with the orchestra and the soundtrack, kind of like an angelic accompaniment, but without the angels. And I'm just going to assume that this was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. No sooner did I get possession of myself than I asked the personages which of all the churches I should join. Now, remember, that is in the 1838 account, but in the 1832 account, Joseph Smith had already come to, his, to the conclusion that all the churches were wrong, and he was going into the grove to uh, receive a remission of his sins. I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong, and that none of them was acknowledged of God as his church and kingdom. Now, the filmmakers decide to leave off of the official narrative here that uh, all of their creeds are an abomination. All the professors of religion are corrupt. They draw near unto me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's from the official 1838 account, which they leave out here. Perhaps uh, these are somewhat unpalatable and controversial uh, topics, which uh, might not do very well in a wider audience. And I was expressly commanded to go not after them 
at the same time receiving a promise that the fullness of the gospel should at some future time be made known unto me. Now, God tells Joseph Smith that he should not join any other churches and that the restoration um, would be forthcoming. So it's a little strange that Joseph Smith's mother and a couple of his siblings joined the Presbyterian Church. Uh, I, I think it was a short time. It might have been a couple of years after that. And of course, this movie makes no mention of Joseph Smith receiving a remission of sins that's emphasized in the first two accounts of the first vision. Uh, and in the earliest accounts, the divine messengers, uh, the divine messenger or messengers, makes no mention of corrupt churches whatsoever. Okay, uh, the first vision is complete, and the sound, the music cuts out, and once again, the nature sounds are turned back up. And we're going to return back to the official uh, church, the canonized version of the first vision here once again. I love that they don't have the use of music during these scenes. I'm a musician, so I always pay attention to the music. It really just gives you a nice, peaceful feeling. I had actually seen a light, and in the midst of that light, I saw two personages, and they did in reality speak to me. And though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. He says he was hated and persecuted for saying that he had seen a vision. That is an extremely controversial claim because the first vision was not widely discussed, even among faithful Latter-day Saints, and Joseph's immediately, immediate family for years after this. Some notable uh, First Vision non-mentions. In other words, uh, times when the First Vision was not mentioned, because he said that he was uh, persecuted for saying he had a vision. It wasn't in uh, Mormonism Unveiled, which is the first anti-Mormon book in 1834. It wasn't in any of the local papers. It wasn't in uh, Alexander Campbell, failed to mention it. J.B. Turner also did not mention it in, uh, 19, in 1842 in Mormonism for All Ages. John Whitmer, the first church historian, didn't mention it. John Carell, who replaced John Whitmer in 1839, is the second church historian, didn't mention it. Sidney Rigdon, nope. Evening of Morning Star, uh, official church publication, missing. Missions are an advocate, left it off. It's not in the Book of Commandments, except maybe in one tiny spot in section 20, which is kind of iffy. It's not in the Book of Mormon. It's not in Joseph Smith's history by his mother. Brigham Young never talked about the first vision. The first vision did not, the narrative of the first vision did not achieve ascendancy in the church until the 1870s. The official version was not canonized until 1880, 60 years after it took place, and it was not included in the missionary discussions until 1961. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it. It says he could not deny it, but apparently he didn't talk about it very much at all. In fact, he didn't even write it down for another 12 years. Once again, the Lord had parted the heavens and had spoken to Joseph as he had to Adam, Abraham, Moses, Paul, and others. And through his prophet Joseph, through the first vision and the revelations that followed, the gospel and true church of Jesus Christ was restored in its fullness. In fact, there's three narrators in this film. You have Joseph Smith himself, then we have the narrator that we just heard, and then we have uh, Francis Uri. So I, I, I'm just going to back that up for a second. Listen to the difference in between the two narrators. Truly seen a light, and in the midst of that light, I saw two personages, and they did in reality speak to me. And though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, Yet it was true. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it. Yet. There's your first narrator. And then a short time later, we get to hear from a different narrator, and Joseph Smith, his own voice narrates. Here's the, the other narrator. Once again, the Lord had parted the heavens. What happened to the first guy? to Joseph as he had to Adam, Abraham, Moses, Paul, and others. And through his prophet Joseph, through the first vision and the revelations that followed, the gospel and true church of Jesus Christ was restored in its fullness to the earth. 
Now, we don't get to see this, but immediately after this, as soon as he got home, what did he tell his family? Well, we have this from uh, Joseph Smith's mother. Um, he said when he returned from this uh, experience, quote, I have learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true, end quote. And that's what he told them. That is rather a small takeaway from this uh, incredible theophany, wouldn't you say so? If the film's version of Joseph Smith seeing two beings at the same time is true, in other words, that Joseph Smith knew that there was a tritheistic Godhead in 1820, why is the Book of Mormon seemingly Trinitarian? And, and then why don't the canonized lectures on faith teach what Joseph Smith learned in the Sacred Grove earlier? Why doesn't the Book of, Mam Book of Commandments reflect a tritheistic Godhead? As I mentioned before, um, the Saints, uh, the Saints book, tries to reconcile the new, the new Saints history publication tries to reconcile the different versions of the first vision into one cohesive narrative. And I think that they've done a good job as you possibly can in trying to put four primary sources together along with five secondary sources together. You can only get so much cohesion. And I think that when it comes to trying to um, synchronize those particular uh, versions. I think that they've done the best job that they can. Now, David Jacobs, he said, that's the director of this film. He said that the first uh, vision was the, uh, the first vision, this film was the hardest thing that he ever did. And he did a number of church films. Um, this film operated on a budget that was so small that none of the cast received any compensation whatsoever. Now, the church has redone this film. This is their first crack at doing a real first vision film. They've redone this film uh, quite a few times. In fact, um, the most recent remake is Ask of God, Joseph Smith's First Vision. This was created in 2015 to give uh, viewers a special experience at the Church History Museum. So this is on the church's official website. That's it. For the, that's it. It's a 15 minute film. <laughs> I can't give you everything I got. Now, our next review. Uh, uh, if you were hoping for more, that's, that's all I can give to you. Uh, now, our next review. Uh, for time or eternity, and this is in 1969, a young woman is tempted to give into pressure from her boyfriend to marry outside the temple. The story is one imagined by pre-mortal spirits contemplating the future trials of earth life. If you got this far, leave us, uh, drop me a like, drop a subscription, or you can send me an email to mormonmoviereviews at gmail.com. Thanks so much for being here. So long.